Welcome back to Tar Heel History, episode number nine. We're going to cover distilling turpentine. Now, tar and pitch were made in a mound out of the dead tree hearts. Turpentine is made out of the living tree. Last week we showed you how to streak the trees, how they cut the trees with the tools, got the resin, they placed it in crude barrels in the woods, came through, picked it up on a wagon and off a road that ran through the woods, through the trees, and then brought it to a platform like this where they had their distilling operation set up. Now until 1834, there was no copper steels. They were all cast iron. And most of them were down in Wilmington. And you just took your crude gum or resin or oleo resin that you fill these barrels with down there and sold the crude resin to them. And they distilled it in a huge cast iron pot. And then they barreled it and shipped it to England and different places. But in 1834, they invented a copper steel. Also, the demand in the 1830s went through the roof when you couldn't find whales and whale oil, and they needed to make camphene, which was three parts alcohol, one part turpentine. So now a lot of these farmers, instead of just collecting the gum, they called it, or the resin, oleo resin, and selling it, they started selling the turpentine because in 1846 it got to you know 37 cents a gallon for distilled turpentine which made it you know uh, times 32 gallons in a barrel you know do, do the math it was huge profits um, and so a lot of those guys wanted to start their own distilleries and they did because of the copper steel. You could move this copper steel from place to place in a wagon and set it up again and work a new patch of woods. And so that made it possible for them to start their own distilling and actually selling the spirits, they called it, the spirits of turpentine, which are cooked off from the original resin. Now these are the cheap barrels ringed with saplings that Olmsted describes. It's, they were mainly straight and they had a square hole in the end of them to put your resin in and they sat in the woods and you went into that road and dumped your resin in here. The wagon backed up, unloaded these and then they dumped them into your copper steel. Now you had steels that would would accept seven of these, or nine of these, or eleven. Seven, nine, or eleven barrel steels, thirty-two gallon barrels. These were dumped into this copper kettle with the lid off, off of this platform, so they didn't have to pick them up. All they had to do was, you know, dump them in there. Okay, then place the top on the steel, put clay around it, here, here, put some water in there with your resin, usually about half as much as your resin you put in there, and then seal it up and build a fire. Now in the early days, of course, they wouldn't build a building everywhere they moved their steels to. They just sat them out in the edge of the woods. But as things progressed, they started building shelters like you see here so that they could keep operations going even in the, the pouring rain or whatever. And you see you had a platform, you had a, a cheap shelter type situation. And then they would back a wagon up to this platform and unload these cheap made barrels, which is what they put resin in in the woods because they didn't have to be sturdy at all to hold resin because resin sets up like Italian ice. And therefore, these cheap barrels, you know, that have, are, are made to throw away, 
uh, basically it's what they would put the oleo resin in as they were dipping it out of the boxes in the woods. And like I said, you had boxes on each side of a road, a thousand to two thousand boxes on each side was called a drift. And then in the middle of the road, they placed these cheap made barrels, Olmstead specifications when he wrote, when he came through here in 1856, we used his specs to build these barrels that are, you know, ringed with saplings. They're, they're built exactly like what he described in his books, in his writings. And then they have a square hole in the top where you would go out to the road when your bucket was full and put your resin in these cheap barrels. They would bring those barrels on a wagon back to this platform somewhere in the woods, back up here, unload them, and then they would empty them into the steel, which you see in the middle, the copper steel. Now, after these barrels were filled, these steels were filled with oleo resin out of the tree and water. Then you would build a fire up underneath the steel, okay? And you had a man called a sounder. Back then, they didn't have pressure gauges, so you listened to this all day long. When it's right, it has a certain tick to it. And when it gets too hot, they will explode if you don't take the fire away from it. So he would listen to it. And if he was an old man, he knew what he was doing because these things were bad for exploding, throwing that resin all over the woods on fire, setting the woods on fire, which why they didn't want them near a town because it would burn the towns down. They were made of wood. And so turpentine fires were very much a cause of towns burning down back in that time, or homes, or barns. So that's why they took them way out in the woods and stayed in the woods where it was a long way to town. But as this thing got to sounding too hot, boiling too much, he could hear that. That's why they called him a sounder. He listened to this all day long. And he would put wood in or take wood out to keep the sound going correctly inside of this steel, percolating, cooking. And he knew how it was supposed to sound. And if it got too hot, you would pull the fire away from it, let it cool off, and then add back the wood again. Okay. Now, as you build your fire, and as this comes to a boil inside of this steel, the steam comes up through this V into this neck, into that copper pipe, which goes out into a condenser, which is basically another barrel that they would run water to from a stream. So they would be close to a river or stream where they could get cold water here all the time in that condenser. Because when your steam, your resin steam comes up here, it's a steam. As it goes through that condenser, that cold water turns around that hot pipe, turns it into a liquid, and that liquid runs into a barrel. And basically what you've got in that liquid after it condenses back to a liquid is turpentine and water. Turpentine is an oil. The oleo resin out of these pine trees is an oil, the oil of the pine tree. So it will float on top of the water. So they would separate in the barrel. After it left the condenser, that pipe would come over and into a barrel, wooden barrel. Now the liquid turpentine and water are going to come into this barrel as you're cooking the steel. And as it's changing into a liquid, it's running into the barrel and separating. And after you let it sit for a little while, the turpentine being an oil will float on top of the water, which leaves the water down here like this in the bottom. So what they would do is have a peacock on it and open it up so that the water can flow out of the barrel, out the bottom. And then when they start getting turpentine, they cut it back off.
which leaves the pure spirit of turpentine and the water runs out the bottom but your oil that floats on top eventually fills up this barrel and then they open this and fill up other oak barrels that have been glued with special animal glue inside for turpentine and they would put them all together seal them up and set them aside at 37 cents a gallon in 1846 that's a lot of money right there okay that would take three or four hours to cook off you know one steel full of resin into turpentine but they did this all day long as soon as they would finish up with one batch they would reload it again and go again and your sounder would work there all day long and he made two dollar fifty cent a day versus fifty cent a day because he was so skilled and because it took a skilled man to produce that perfect turpentine spirits and of course it came out of the steel and you can see it all here out the top of the steel through a condenser full of cold water and then into a barrel where you drained off the water left your spirits and uh, basically when you cook that resin that's in the steel, when it cooks, it's white when you get it out of the tree. And you cook it in your steel, but when it cooks in there, of course, it stays in the steel. The steam comes off of it, that's turpentine. But the product left in the steel itself turns a brownish color or in a tan color and there were 13 grades of that so when you got done cooking off your turpentine you had to empty your steel and what's left in there is called rosin r-o-s-i-n now resin comes out of the tree rosin comes out of the steel after it's cooked and it would set up hard that's what they use on fiddle strings and stuff and we'll show you some of that in a later video but rosin was left in your steel. You would dump that out. And in the early days, there was no market for it. It was so cheap, it wasn't even worth hauling out of wood. You didn't have so many fiddles. And there was nothing else they did with it. So they would dump it in these woods behind us in these bottoms. They would just dump it out, let it run down while it's hot. And then when it go in the bottom, it sets up solid, like glass or plastic. And they will continue to dump those time after time after time into places that they didn't walk that were down in these bottoms. And they were called rosin dumps. And they dump them in the rivers, they dump them in streams, they dump them in ponds, creeks, anything to get rid of it. Well, later on after the Civil War, one of Sherman's men came through this area and noticed a huge rosin dump. And after Civil War, they started using rosin in many different products, including soap, makeup, cosmetics, all kind of things, that, and plus fiddle strings, okay, or bow strings for a fiddle. And so they started coming back. He came back from up north after the war, right near where we are right now, leased the land that that rosin was on, that dump, huge dump, that was known all around this area now that I found out people knew where it was at way back and he started mining it breaking it up out of the ground melting it down putting it in barrels and shipping it to Wilmington down the Cape Fear River so he started it and when he started it and it was selling good all the people of this area also started doing the same thing they started going back where granddaddy dumped his steels in the bottoms and creeks and those rosin dumps they were draining lakes damming up rivers damming creeks wherever they could get to that rosin digging it out melting it down putting it in barrels and carrying it selling it when it became a big commodity so rosin comes out of the steel resin comes out of the tree After they barreled tar pitch and turpentine all year, and in the spring, 
loaded it on the rafts that they built out of the ton timber that they cut to sail to England also and Boston and New York and out west. They built the rafts, they hauled these barrels down there, they placed them on the rafts, they went down to Wilmington. When they got to Wilmington at the docks, they pulled up there. Sometimes there would be 50,000 of these barrels on the docks already. A British proctor would tell you where to pull up to to sell your products. You would pull up there and this is how they weighed the barrels. Each barrel um, was supposed to weigh 320 pounds. And this is the exact setup they used, the exact scale system they used to weigh barrels. So you'd have two men pick the barrel up, hook it, hook it here, then you'd move your weight down and this barrel should equal out this scale at 320 pounds. And that's why if they didn't at the, at the site, if they were not weighing enough, they added rocks, water, uh, anything they could slubber over and put in there to make the barrel heavy enough so when it got down there, it weighed that. It was the same that yesterday is today is tomorrow. Whatever it took to sell a barrel. And that was tall, pitch, and turpentine. Okay? Now these are original tools that were used to weigh these barrels, but they were also used to weigh cotton bales. This is a cotton scale. As you can see, there's your metal pointer, and this used to hang it up, and you got a weight that goes down here, it's numbered. The chains were made with hooks so that they will hook the barrel in the lips to hold it on each side so you could lift it to weigh it. And in the end, you can see the brand, my brand, of barrel because each cooper, each operation that sold them stuff in Wilmington products had, remember, we talked about this in another video, had to start branding their barrel with a two inch brand. And that was because there was so much stuff added to these barrels and so many of them leaking on the docks when the weather got hot and so much product getting lost after they paid for it by weight that they started making them do these brands so it could be charged back to the operation the next year when you went back to sell again. If they lost product out of your barrels, then you had to pay for that the next year. And this is a barrel we made that's made to the same specs as what they used, a 32 gallon barrel. It's 31 and a half inch staves and 19, 19 and a half inch heads. And that gives you 32 gallons of product. And the way you would do this weight system after you hang your barrel and you go down here and you can see 320 you would hang a weight there especially for the scale and it should balance out this concludes this video on turpentining and we appreciate you watching we welcome you to North Carolina history Tar Heel history we ask you to subscribe to the channel if you will and in our next video, we're going to be actually cooking the turpentine in our little small steel.